Thank you, Mace. Thank, thanks, everybody. Um, yeah, what a perfect night for the Dharma here in San Francisco. It's so stormy. Gnome is home. Wonderful. So um, yeah, wherever wherever you are um, joining from, of course, is a perfect night for the Dharma. But there's something about the the rain streaked windows and the wind, and yeah, it just feels easy to feel that we're coming home to um, our true refuge here, our inner refuge. And <clears throat> as is very often the case in our well of being evenings, we are following a text. And for me, the often or frequent experience is the text that happens to be tonight is exactly the text I need. So we are on chapter seven, which is altruistic love and compassion. So such a tender, beautiful, beautiful um, series of readings that we'll do together. My hope is actually to do two meditations tonight, um, but I'll hold that lightly. If there's a lot of discussion and, and questions, we can make the second one a little shorter. But love and compassion or altruistic love and compassion, they're different. And it's important for us to hold that in mind and of course, draw from our direct experience. The book that we are working from now is On the Path to Enlightenment, which is an edited collection of ancient masters and contemporary masters in Tibetan Buddhism by Matthew Ricard. And some of these masters are very well known to folks in the Sangha, maybe some are lesser known, but I'm really struck that some of the people he includes in these texts that he finds to be the most essential teachings on the path are not only scholars, they're also people who are just drawing their understanding of the Dharma from their direct experience. And that that really will inform us of these teachings in, in, in a deep way. The texts, of course, are such important and valuable guideposts, but our direct experience is incomparably important. So without further preamble, uh, let's move to our direct experience in this first practice. I'm gonna invite us to consider in this first practice, the very traditional Bodhisattva prayer. So I will be reading that for us. Some of you may know that this prayer is, is from Shantideva and it is the prayer that His Holiness, the Dalai Lama says that he recites every single day, many times over at the beginning of his day Beginning of his day is 3 a.m. <laughs> um, so that's, <clears throat> he gets a leg up on many of us, but we can all start and um, integrating this Bodhisattva prayer, at least for this evening. And maybe we also decide to use it in the morning. If someone's asking you what page you're gonna be reading from. Yes. I am going to be reading from page 85. That's where we're starting. So in by a comfortable posture inviting your body to feel completely at ease, supported by the ground beneath you. And feel an inspiration, that motivation which brought you here this evening. Feel that inspiration or motivation as though it were pulling you up from your sacrum to the top of your head, giving you that tall, upright spine. Soften your gaze, either closing your eyes or having them just focused in front of you. 
you could imagine, especially as we settle into practice, that your eyes were gazing directly at your own heart. Invite a gentleness, an ease and relaxation through the forehead and the brow. A deep softening through the eyes. Relaxing, a releasing maybe even a melting of tension through the jaw. Invite your attention and awareness to fully drop into the body as if you had been hanging around the side of the pool and decided to just fully immerse yourself. Immerse yourself in the felt experience of the body and whatever you find there. Explore this wonderful paradox of stillness, as in not moving the form body. And movement, all the vital energy dancing throughout the body. Invite your energy to keep dropping from the head center into the body. Consider this sacred possibility that right now, the most valuable thing you can be doing is bringing your full attention and awareness into the sensations of the body. And with that, release gently thoughts, memories, images, excitations, planning. If the sounds of the wind outside arise, notice how that is experienced in the body. If a sudden thought or memory arises, again, notice 
What is the impact or influence of this thought or memory within the body? while still remaining firmly rooted in the felt sensation of being in the body. We can consider and remember that the purpose of our practice is greater than just us. In the words of Shantideva, we can consider our practice as a dedication, dedicating our heart, body, and mind in service of all beings. May I be a guard for those who are protectorless. a guide for those who journey on the road, for those who wish to cross the water, may I be a boat, a raft, a bridge. May I be an island for those who yearn for land, a lamp for those who long for light, for all who need a resting place, a bed. For those who need a servant, may I be their slave. May I be the wishing jewel, the vase of plenty, a word of power and the supreme healing. May I be the tree of miracles and for every being, the abundant cow. Just like the earth and space itself and other of the mighty elements for boundless multitudes of being may always be the ground of life, the source of varied sustenance. Thus for everything that lives, as far are the limits of the sky. May I be constantly their source of livelihood until they pass beyond all sorrow. The essence of this practice invites us to consider how we can show up for what is needed and how it is needed. We can fan the flame of our altruistic spark 
our desire to care and be of service. I mean, consider that that one spark could grow to illuminate and bring light to the entire planet and all beings. Take a couple more moments before we transition this to a practice of compassion to see if you can feel that spark, that sense of intrinsic caring. It may become covered over by despair or overwhelm, fatigue or self-centeredness. We may forget our inborn capacity to care for others, but it remains. We can feel confidence in it. We can feel courage from it. move towards a practice of tonglen, giving and receiving. You can imagine that spark lighting up, becoming as though a sphere of light hovering in front of our heart. Before we consider taking on the struggles and difficulties of others, learning this incredible practice of transformation. We feel into this moment of light, into that spark that becomes golden illumination, which is unbreakable and which is infinite. while imagining this sphere of light in front of our heart, we can consider someone who is dear to us, someone we care for, who's going through a difficult time or a challenge. Even as we bring their face to mind, we might sense a sense of squeeze in the heart, heaviness, a desire to help and care. Without a lot of elaboration or concepts, just notice this feeling of desire to care in the presence of someone who's struggling, experiencing difficulty. Again, bringing this cherished face to mind, imagining the struggle and challenge. Leaning into that desire 
to be able to transform, to lighten the load. And with our next breath, we imagine that we could pour out the struggle and difficulty of this precious being and that would turn into a little pool, a dark swirling cloud of smoke, just hovering in front of the belly button line. And with our breath, with our inhale, we imagine drawing that dark pool of smoke into that radiant sphere of light. And with our exhale, we release the smoke, transformed, clear, free. Inhale, drawing in with that heartfelt aspiration of compassion to alleviate the suffering of this being. Exhale that same wish, may you be free. On the rhythm of your own breath, continue this practice of transformation, courageously taking on some of the difficulty in order to transform it and sending out that wish of compassion. May you be free. It's okay if it's hard to feel into it and just practice preparing the heart to receive this wish of compassion. Or if it feels too strong and overwhelming, it's okay to just lean back and steady yourself in the breath for a little while. Otherwise, just a couple more breaths here, completing this cycle, this offering offering to take a bit of the burden and to transform it. Gently release the image of this beloved being. Let it recede into the background. And expand the heart of compassion, imagining all the other beings who may also be experiencing this kind of challenge. Someone just like this cherished being Imagine them radiating in a circle in front of you. And consider engaging that same courage, that same heartfelt aspiration. May all beings like those who I cherish be free from their suffering and struggling. And as we gently break down this barrier of our heart between those we cherish and those unknown, once again, we imagine all these beings, known and unknown, pouring out their struggle, this little pool of dark smoke just in front of the belly button line.
Feel the strength and uprightness of the back. Able to hold us upright as we invite in courageously with his aspiration to transform. And with our next breath, inhale, drawing in this little pool, dense and dark, to the radiant, spacious light at our heart. Exhaling, transformed, may you be free. Continue with the visualization with this process. Building yourself as the warrior of compassion by expanding the heart wider and wider. If the feeling gets a little vague, you can remember this cherished being again and allow that sense of care for this one being to extend to all the other beings. One or two more breaths here. And then possibly placing one palm on the heart. Connecting once again to that spark. Mm, opening our heart once again, this time bringing ourselves to mind. Something we are struggling with. Maybe it's just the presence of this being we care for who's struggling and suffering and its impact on us. Maybe there's another area that's really present today struggle with health, struggle with family, struggle with work, the list goes on and on. Maybe just choose one thing and really focus on this difficulty and your desire to alleviate the suffering. With this struggle in mind, again, as though you could pour out this difficulty once again into a swirling, dense, dark cloud of smoke just in front of the belly button line. Offer this compassion, this opportunity for transformation to yourself right here, right now.
And with your next breaths, consider imagining these tendrils of smoke traveling up and as though they were mist evaporating in the light of the sun. Feel them to be completely transformed at the heart center. Inhale, drawing in with this aspiration of compassion. Exhale, extending that aspiration. May I be free. Inhale, drawing in, <clears throat> exhale, extending this heartfelt wish. Just <clears throat> one breath more, drawing up those final last tendrils. The hand has been at the heart, gently releasing it to the lap. And releasing the images, the aspirations, and just resting in the state of awareness infused with compassion. Feeling this very body to be a body of compassion. Feeling this heart to be a heart of compassion. Feeling this mind, a mind of compassion. Thank you all for your practice. Any reflections or questions on the practice? Your first person experience of bodhicitta and compassion before we go to the text.
raise your hand or write in the chat. Share something. Um, I felt such a deepening when, yeah, like coming to mind this person that I love a lot who's suffering right now, and then extending that outwards towards um, all people. It was such like an opening into cultivating compassion for people whom I don't know. Um, and that you know, that's part of the Bodhisattva vow, of course. And I feel like that can be um, tricky at times to be like, how do I, you know, extend a compassion to people I don't know, and we're all innately human and suffering. <laughs> um, and so having it with this friend, um, and then just like the recognition that like, kind of like the sentiment of like, all beings were my mother once, you know, like all beings could be my best friend. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you. Exactly. Yeah. It does. It does require a little bit of a um, a leap cognitively for most of us to kind of consider that. And um, that's yeah. That's why it's the kind of genius of these practices, right? That start with those for whom we can kind of naturally have that what's called kind of kin or familial compassion, the compassion that we feel towards those close to us. And there's been a debate among psychologists and, and um, others. Um, can we really have a global compassion? And there's no evidence we can't. <laughs> and yet there's a lot of evidence that it's easier for those we care about, maybe more reflexive. The global might just require more training. And I think this practice is such a, um, a useful way for us to, to train in that and um, make that sense of global compassion more, more real. It doesn't need to be, ideally, of course, it will be an action, but we, we don't need to start there. I think, again, that's such a huge, huge obstacle for folks is I can't care about everyone. I, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't have enough for myself. I wouldn't know, um, <clears throat> you know, I, I don't have enough time. I don't have enough money. I don't have enough resources. And the practice itself can be the entire training ground, which is really inspiring. I think Heidi, I think unhoused, I imagine. Is that correct? Uh, helping with our local unhoused. This practice reminds me of their need right now with the cold and the weather. Yeah, absolutely. It's, um, there, is, there is such a great need, of course, in the city, but um, all over the world, just for the basics. And for some of us, especially if we could connect that to someone we know, if we work directly with unhoused folks or unsheltered folks, then it's much easier to imagine that for all beings without shelter. This is why it's so, you know, powerful or it can be, you know, journalism and fiction writing. Um, there's a really interesting parallel I, I was going to get into um, with with one of these um, prac or one of these excerpts, which is in order for our, our compassion to be really poignant, it, it includes wisdom. And there's a many definitions for wisdom, but one I was thinking of today that um, really relates and resonates with this idea of the specific practice is in order for us to have compassion at a level that's um, 
poignant, feels real. We need some empathy. We need to imagine the experience of the other, what it's like for them, really have a sense, and that can really ignite our compassion in a more direct way. Yeah, I think it's a, I think it's, it's, it's a really interesting feature of being able to apply our day-to-day -day experience of other struggles and make that the fuel of compassion. Um, Claudia writes, I have a close relative who's dying of cancer. I'm so sorry, Claudia. And uh, we went to visit her and bring food and company. I don't know who benefits the most. She's got such strength to see the beauty in life. Uh, gratitude and courage to fight in spite of the excruciating pain. Yeah, that's so inspiring indeed. Yeah. And this is, um, there was a really wonderful talk. Maybe some of you caught it. Uh, His Holiness the Dalai Lama had a conversation with um, a couple scientists, uh, Alyssa Eppel and uh, Lonnie Shioda. And a lot of the conversation was how do we work with these uncertain times? and maintain hope and courage and presence. And the Dalai Lama was talking about this altruistic love, just exactly what we're talking about tonight. And he said, the altruistic love, our ability to feel happy and care about others and want for their well-being, is undoubtedly the best recipe for our own well-being. And it's interesting, especially in the fields of psychology and sometimes positive psychology, there's a bit of an emphasis on feeling good for you. Like let's, let's do these positive experiences and we will feel good. And we actually, it's hilarious. We miss out on what would really feel good is helping others. And that this joy is doubled when we include others. And some of you may remember when we were reading the guide to the Bodhisattva way of life and Pema Chodron has just this lovely interpretation um, of that teaching and of that core text. And it reminds you that you can practice loving kindness at any moment you experience something enjoyable. So I had the amazing good fortune today to receive an acupuncture treatment. Uh, it was really helpful. And I really offered it in the moment because I was reading this text this morning, preparing for tonight. It's like, oh, maybe I'll try that all day. Offer everything I experience up for all beings. Every smile I see, every kind of um, yeah experience of comfort or ease or joy, can I make that a dedication and an offering? So I think there's a lot of ways we can just um, make these practices just feel so integrated into our down on the ground experience. Um, I want to share Matthew Ricard's uh, definition here of altruistic love and compassion. This is just on page 77. It's really simple. He says, in the Buddhist sense, altruistic love is defined as the wish that all beings may find happiness and the causes of happiness, and compassion as the wish that all beings may be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. The only piece of that that might be more nuanced than we recognize is not just free of suffering and not just find happiness, but of the causes really actually difficult for us sometimes to connect with those true, true causes. So it's one thing to wish someone to be happy, but it's another thing for them to be aware of true happiness and the causes of true happiness. Essentially, there's no happiness if we aren't aware of the true causes of happiness. There's temporary pleasure, temporary pleasure. Um, and as I, I love to quote of Sokni Rinpoche, Samsara almost works in you know, our 21st century culture, especially in North America. We can almost avoid pain by jumping from one pleasurable experience to the next. It does catch up with us. Um, and we don't wanna wish that on someone like, oh yeah, I wish you fame and money and power. Um, that's actually wishing someone to be truly, genuinely unhappy right? Have them bound up in striving, disappointment, and attachment. So a true wise wish for someone to be happy is for them to know the causes of happiness. That doesn't mean we don't want them to have whatever they want, cupcakes, power, um, 
many friends, but if we don't know the causes that are true of our happiness, we will make ourselves miserable. And the same is true with our compassion. Of course, we want to relieve suffering, blatant suffering, less blatant suffering, kind of that more background understanding and difficulty. But the true freedom is in understanding the causes of our suffering. This may be an experience some of you have um, developing your own path here. And we get this experience sometimes where we start to see these patterns of our anger, of our jealousy, of our sadness. And it all points back to one thing, us. <laughs> and then we see our friends and loved ones, you know, also anger, sadness, disappointment, but they are pointing outward. And, you know, that's, there's still the pain both ways, but there's a kind of perpetuation of the pain if we continue to think that it's outside of us, that it's not bound up with essentially the mental poisons, right? Not seeing reality as it is and just trying to grasp onto things and protect this super fragile uh, identity that we try to parade around and make sure everybody likes all the time. Um, so it's a, a really beautiful, such a simple definition. Happy, true causes of happiness compassion, true causes of suffering. Um, and, and another thing Matthew says in this opening description is that these two can be summed up as unconditional kindness towards all being in general that is ready to manifest at all times towards any individual in particular. So I think there's two important parts there that it's always at the ready and that's towards anyone. And that's a high bar, right? Of our, our developing our love and compassion, that it's always at the ready. But for, um, you know, for most of us as our practice, we do start our practice with bodhicitta. Maybe we start our day with bodhicitta and there's kind of no upper limit. You can really engage with that compassionate desire anytime. Even after you've had like, an, like a difficult or not so compassionate thought, there's no time that you can't apply a little bit of what in psychology is called a positive reappraisal, like a compassionate reappraisal. So let's say we have a really difficult meeting and we feel like no one heard us and we're just mad or pissed. Like no one understands me. God, this place sucks. I just hate everything. We can have compassion right there. No problem. And still be cultivating that within any situation, making it ready and available. I think I used to um, really struggle feeling like I was kind of making progress in compassion before I started really recognizing that, for me at least, it was okay for compassion to be the second thought, not just the first thought, right? Like some unexpected event arises and maybe my first thought is not compassionate. Right? Maybe it's self-disparaging or maybe it's blame, but my second thought can be compassion. And that's not only like good enough, it's really good. It's really good. We really can um, get into that. And, you know, Matthew here points out that love and compassion must be informed by wisdom. Again, understanding the immediate causes of suffering. And, you know, he describes that, that as long as our mind is clouded by confusion and hatred, attachment, jealousy, and arrogance, that the suffering will always manifest. And that these, all of themselves, like all of these mental poisons are created in between our perception and reality. And this is not a, a, a highly conceptual term or idea. All of us have experienced this. So maybe we go with our friend, imagine us uh, going to the new San Francisco Dharma Collective in person. And I'm walking in with my friend Gina and we're like, hey, here's the new center. And I look at the center and I'm like, oh my God, I can't believe, why did they put all of the things over there? And 
oh, I don't like this. I have like disgust and aversion. And Gina's like, this grandmother's house, I feel so at home. Same reality, different perception. So that's, that's unfortunately a lot of how we're living. Can you guys still hear me? My can internet. You, can you reread that? Yeah. Okay. And you got and you caught off a little bit. You're back. You froze for a minute. Yeah. Okay. Uh, as long as your mind is clouded by confusion, hatred, attachment, jealousy, and arrogance, suffering in all its forms will manifest. The source of these mental poisons is ignorance of the nature of beings and things. It creates a gulf between our perceptions and reality. What page? That is on 78. And then Shantideva again here on 79. He says, all the joy the world contains has come through wishing happiness for others. All the misery the world contains has come from wanting pleasure for oneself. Is there any need for lengthy explanation? Childish beings look out for themselves while Buddhas labor for the good of others. See the difference that divides them. And this is tough. <clears throat> it's a really different orientation of what brings us happiness and well-being than, again, is often promoted in, in positive psychology, contemporary psychology, and also in capitalism, right? It's, it's what if you gave for Christmas to someone, you know, you're like, I, what I want to give you for Christmas is just my positive regard for you. Like, I care for you. Maybe in this crew that would fly, but for most people they're like, yeah, and what else? So it's, you know, it's, it is, it is, you know, going against the stream um, to seek these forms of happiness. On page 80, Shakbar says, now I have some heart advice to give you. A sky needs a sun, a mother needs a child, and a bird needs two wings. Likewise, emptiness alone is not enough. You need to have great compassion for all beings who have not realized this emptiness. Enemies, friends, and strangers. You need to have compassion that makes no distinction between good and bad. You must understand that compassion arises through meditation, not simply from waiting, thinking it may come forth by itself from emptiness. The same number of years you spent meditating on emptiness, you should now spend meditating day and night on compassion. A compassion a hundred times stronger than that of a mother for a child burnt in a fire. An unbearably intense compassion that arises when thinking about suffering of sentient beings. So I think this is interesting. Um, obviously that's pretty intense. But one thing that it uh, points out is we actually really have to have some kind of mastery of emptiness as we're embarking on compassion. And I know something that uh, Mace has brought up many times, our compassion warrior in the public education system, is how can we keep caring and keep caring and keep caring without feeling overwhelmed and despair? And I think it's you know pointed to in this description that we actually have to have this understanding of emptiness, this understanding that everything is connected. Everything is changing. The Dalai Lama said in that recent talk he gave, he was mentioning that our ability to have courage and our ability to have confidence require us to have a very long view, which is an interesting way of describing emptiness. Re, not just our immediate circumstances, but everything that impacts that, 
everything that impacts that and everything that impacts that so far into a future we don't know. And everything that led up to this and then led up to that and led up to, right? It's just this huge view. This huge view is that view of emptiness. All the connections, all the subtle, tiny things shifting and changing all the time. So that's actually the platform for our compassion. Not only that kind of heartfelt aspiration, not only that spark we were working with in meditation, but all the space around it. Mace, are you convinced? Trying to be convinced. <laughs> I think the long view is super helpful. Yeah, it's unintuitive. Just like caring for people outside of our kin, it's unintuitive to think about long-term. It's really unintuitive. So Walt, I see our altruistic love and compassion truly altruistic, at least philosophically. If we derive happiness and pleasure from extending and wishing them? I love that question. I am so ready for that question. Um, in that two things, enlightened self-interest is not a problem, right? In that like being of service, feeling compassion and loving kindness to others feels good for us. It's not a problem. Actually, it's, it's, it's kind of you could think of it as woven into like some sort of great, beautiful divine plan for humanity and for community. You will have sociologists. There's one I remember, Rob Willer uh, at Berkeley, and he was determined that compassion had to be heroic, self-sacrifice. I think we're done with that. <laughs> I think we're done with that. I don't think we need that. I think it's still compassion, even if you don't suffer. The other piece, and I know that um, many of you have heard me say this a lot, is in order for us to really, with full kind of reckless abandon, have compassion, we also have to have a full, like really dedicated practice of giving up hope of fruition. Giving up a hope or sense that what we do will have the intended consequence we want. So I think it's, you know, I think it's interesting. We can have compassion and know it will feel good and not try to impact the outcome. Our feeling good can't be that I have compassion, so I'm gonna help my friend out who's in a bad place and I'll feel good if they're in a better place. Or we can just feel good about helping. And I think that that's um, wholesome and realistic. And again, with the long view, maybe it doesn't help them right now. Maybe it doesn't help them even in a year. Maybe it helps them years down the line. Or if this is your belief, maybe in another lifetime. So it's like, again, it's a really interesting act of humility to have that long view. You don't know, and you can't control what you don't know. So that gets really scary and just such a wonderful practice. Other questions or thoughts on this kind of, um, yeah, kind of treaties towards compassion. I was just thinking that so many leaders in the world are like childish and just thinking about themselves and not about their people. And I, and I wish so much that they could have this kind of training or some sort of like CEB, you know? I mean, like really, honestly, so many need yeah. awareness. And, uh, and then for teachers, I mean, <sighs> it's, it's, it's same thing. I really wish that they had more emotional support because, uh, Right now, they're really burning out, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's happened for decades, but it's, it's, it's getting really, so anyway, I guess. Yeah, 
we can do tongling for them as well. Yeah, yeah. I I don't know if I mentioned this here, but I've been teaching this six month course uh, to ANF, which is like the Association of Nurses, and just once a month. And similarly to education, it's just such an acute time of burnout. The field is like emptying out. People are leaving and. Um, I felt very humbled, like what on earth can I do in an hour and a half, once a month? Um, and yet, you know, so heartened giving people this opportunity, like you're suggesting, Claudia, to, to connect with each other and to consider the ways that they can improve. We only accepted people into this program who were leaders and educators. So they're so motivated. And despite the burnout, just so excited to share these ideas with others. As for world political leaders, I think it's important to, you know, again, take that long view. And also there are leaders who do exhibit compassion, who do exemplify those qualities. And um, indeed it does seem like they are the minority, but they're not, There's, there are some. and. Uh, I think it's, um, I think I, yeah, I won't get political because it's too, uh, too difficult to get it right. But suffice to say that, um, yeah, we're seeing a lot of the consequences of those behaviors right now and maybe it will reveal something. Um, and, you know, for us, all of us who are practitioners, like our job is of course to care is of course to act when we can, but more than anything is to be like that light in the world in the incredible opportunity that we might get all of a sudden slammed in an elevator with a world political leader. We'd really wanna show up with our full bodhicitta and be able to um, you know, impress upon them and make them interested and eager about what we're doing and how it's impacting our life. Because indeed, everybody wants to be happy. Everybody wants to avoid suffering. And there's not actually that many ways to do so. Did I see a hand up there, Mace, or no? Sorry to pick on you, but I did see that. Not me, but thank you. OK. Um, I can't remember now what my question It was something about. Um, like how did like how this can get confused with moral distress or empathetic distress mm -hmm. yeah, so i sort of just wanted you to maybe talk about that but yeah also, if someone else has their hand raised so you can decide how you want yeah to I'll, I'll i'll do that and then we'll get to paul which is um you know so empathic distress right this feeling of actual overwhelm is often associated with self-related concern so you're actually distressed because it feels like it's yours. I can't handle that. It's too much for me. So there's still like a, a bit of a, um, a sense of control and ownership over the suffering, even though it's, it's, it could lead to compassion. You know, it does get stuck up, like almost like, you know, when you watch a, watch, watch a river flowing and something gets kind of stuck in an eddy, it's like it gets stuck along the side of our rumination about how bad it is. Moral distress is interesting. You know, it's, it's a different um, thing altogether where people have this sense of distress, needless to say, and, and overwhelm because they're being asked to do something that feels out of alignment with their values, that feels possibly inhumane or dehumanizing. So this is a term that came out of uh, combat Right, so folks who were in um, combat situations and they're asked to do these kind of horrific, um, yeah, massacres or otherwise, um, massacres in person or by drone. And then it's being imported to, you know, healthcare systems, education systems, where, you know, doctors being asked to see patients in nine minutes who have these complex issues that they can't manage and a sense of moral distress. It's really tough for me to sit here and say, <clears throat> they just need to perfect their compassion. I'd say that that's, that's unrealistic. And um, they, can, they can ideally perfect their compassion for themselves, but that those beings 
definitely need their help. So how do we reduce the distress while keeping up that fire of like, how do we change this is I think an important one. So with moral distress, can we take what it is that is that is truly wrong, that is against humanistic values and let that guide us, but not feel so overwhelmed personally? Yeah, thanks for the question. Paul and then Tanya. Yeah, I was reading in the book, the very next paragraph from where you stopped, where it says, yeah. until enlightenment, I shall do whatever is possible to benefit all beings, not omitting a single one, no matter what evil actions they commit. And that I've always had this discussion with people on one of the roads I drive regularly, there's always unhoused or homeless people, whatever you want to call out there. So I try to give them a little bit of money sometimes. But then I get in my head, well, they're only going to take that money and go out and drink or do drugs or whatever. But I've got to let that go because, you know, that's part of not being attached to, you know, a specific outcome or whatever. Mm -hmm. And it's part of that compassion all the time. Yeah. What they do is what they do. Yeah. So I give them a dollar or the guy behind me gives them ten dollars or whatever. Um, and, and like I said, it's a road I drive on regularly several times a week. And I do see the same people out there a lot of times. Yeah. So, you know, they're, they're there, I'm there. So I give it and let it go, you know, because yeah. a couple dollars to me is not nearly the amount of need that a couple dollars to them can do. So hmm. it, it's worth it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love you bringing up the, <laughs> the reality and, you know, sometimes these phrases, I shall do whatever possible. Right. So Paul, does that mean you just get out of your car and let, you know, as many people as can fit in, get in the car and drive, drive it away. <laughs> right. I'm not going to give them the car and I'm going to walk away and they can have the car, but right. I'm going to give them a couple dollars and, Hopefully they'll buy a sandwich before they go buy, you know, whatever their their addiction may be or may not be. I mean, I don't know. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I love that you're just bringing up um, a just being open and flexible and again, having that not um, not a sense of how it should happen, giving up that sense of fruition. And also, I think I'll do whatever possible to benefit all beings that actually is the cultivation of our own compassion. That doesn't like, yeah, you giving your car away would probably help all beings for, you know, maybe a month. That would be like a pretty big bump in someone's day-to-day -day well being to have a cash infusion that they would get from your car. And, but it wouldn't actually help them, right? Well, and so I don't I, know if it would help all beings because I'm a being and that wouldn't help me, so. That's true. It wouldn't help you. Um, and it really, you know, it wouldn't help um, in a long term. So I, I think, you know, reading this as not omitting all, no matter what evil actions. So not that we're necessarily having to um, give and do, but the big effort of like, how do we actually do this for all beings? This one is still so tough and it's developmental stepwise start with these people who are easier, go to people who are maybe unfamiliar and, and go out from there. Yeah, thank you, Paul. Tanya. Hey there, um, can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. Um, so I guess two things, I just wanted to comment on that last piece about wishing well for everyone. One thing came up to, for me the first time in doing that, that you know, I, I have a hard time wishing some people, certain politicians happiness because of their impacts on everybody else. But one of the things that struck me today was like, wow, if that person was genuinely happy, they wouldn't be causing so much misery to everybody else. Mm -hmm. And it would be great for everybody. And, you know, I really want to wish them happiness too, but boy, I mean, there's collateral benefits of if they're happy for everybody and if everybody <laughs> was, right? Right. So that was kind of, I was like, oh, that's cool. That makes it kind of, I, I like that. That helped. I love um, that. 
yeah, yeah. like you know what I mean because they you know you know first the first level is they, they'd be it'd be better for everybody else and then okay it'd be good for them too then the second thing I wanted to comment on which is completely different and I hope it's okay to talk about this but I had seen a video of with Matthew Ricard um, uh, where he was talking about the difference between compassion and empathy. Yeah. And he was talking about it in the context of like they were putting him in some fMRI scan yeah. or something and asking him, oh <laughs> sorry, hang on, my cat just jumped up here. Um, asking him to, you know, meditate either on, you know, being empathetic or compassionate. And he said the empathy, what it was, was he was taking on like everybody's pain, like as his yeah. own, he were talking about ownership and he yeah, said it was yeah. excruciating, but when he switched to compassion, he could have this really heartfelt sense for folks, but he wasn't making their suffering his own. And it helped him, you know, and it wasn't because he was pushing them away, but it was a way of holding it in a way that wasn't like overwhelming him and causing him major distress. So are, are you, do you know about that video? Do you know what I'm talking about? I, I know about the study. So the, the citation, which I'm, because I've done it so many times, it's Klemecki Singer 2014. Um, and it, <laughs> that you, that, that's like it that, is, you know it, yeah. I do, I do know that one because it's like a really classic study in empathy and compassion. Um, and it's interesting because they, they disambiguate a little bit later. Um, they got, I feel like they, they gave compassion a bit of a hard time. They were just talking about emotional contagion, like feel what this person's feeling and how hard it is. With empathy, usually there's also an aspect of imagining what's happening for this person and considering them, not necessarily that merging, right? And I think indeed that merging with another's pain that has enormous physiological impact, you know, that we can see in the brain, also in, you know, our autonomic nervous system. And, you know, it's interesting, I've been really trying to explore this myself is, you know, watching uh, media content, uh, I think I brought this up before, where there's someone who's suffering. We are also experiencing that distress. And, you know, there is, um, I can't remember, I think it was Chogyam Trupa who would, or maybe it was another teacher, um, you know, have his students do a 10 day silent retreat. So just so deep and then drag them to a horror film and be like, practice here. Wow. So that's like some crazy wisdom stuff that I am not prepared for. But this, you know, this idea that like a lot of what we're exposing ourselves to on a day-to-day -day basis has neurological impact, physiological impact. And that indeed our best defense, right? Our best kind of, um, offense and defense is compassion. So we can alleviate the distress, you know, that Matthew um, experienced there um, by having this compassionate response. And again, it might not be the first thing. So maybe we read the headline and it is like just horrific and we experience that pain, that resonance, especially photos, right? Any photo of a mother or father with their child who has been wounded, it's like you have it and then you can apply compassion. And so we, I think that we can um, apply that in our life. And yeah, yeah, please share the link. I haven't heard him in the video um, and I, I will share the link of, of the research study too. Yeah. Sounds good, I'll look at, thank you so much. Thanks, yeah. And Eve, could you give us the link to uh, that talk that you mentioned of the Dalai Lama with Shiota? Yeah, yeah, it's right on the Mind and Life site. Uh -huh. uh, so it's like their first, their most recent event. It's a, an hour long talk. I really recommend it. I have listened to a lot of talks by Dalai Lama and I thought this one was exceptional. Like a lot of really useful information and very personal actually on, on his side. What's the name of the, the first name of the person, Shiota? I'll, gra I'll grab it, Claudia. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. So then, um, yeah, I, actually, Sally mentioned this, but I, I'd love to read it anyway. Uh, Dilgo Kensi Rinpoche says, in each of our countless lives, in beginning with samsara, we have had parents. In fact, we have taken birth so often that at one time or another, every single sentient being must have been our mother or father. 
when we think of all these beings who have been our parents wandering helplessly for so long in samsara, like blind people who have lost their way, we cannot but feel tremendous compassion for them. <laughs> so it's just such a cool, uh, such a cool, interesting way to approach. Um, and he also says, with his compassion constantly in mind, we should perform every positive act, even offering a single flower or reciting a mantra with the wish it may be benefit to all living creatures without exception. So I was mentioning just trying to do that today. I only made it through half the day. I forgot by the middle of the day, let's be honest. But I, um, I rode my bike to the acupuncturist this morning and my God, if anyone was out this morning, the light was just amazing. It was like rain showers and offering it up and just offering it up. Hmm. So this is by Atisha um, on page 87. Nobody has ever seen the least demarcation between the moving waves and the depths of the ocean. Likewise, compassion for all beings immersed in illusion arises spontaneously out of emptiness. It springs forth from emptiness and returns, and to emptiness it returns. This, this beautiful uh, connection between emptiness and compassion. Chandra and I will be teaching uh, next week together, so we'll continue on Chapter 7. It's so rich. Um, there's so much in it. And I think it would be nice for us. So yeah, we can, can prepare a little to have a greater discussion on emptiness and, and how we really integrate that into our daily understanding. If our compassion is supposed to be rising from this emptiness and returning, how do we hang there? I, I still struggle. So I, I would love it if anyone has ideas with some way to describe emptiness in a secular fashion. <laughs> for the work I am wanting to do and share in the world, um, it would help, it's, it's a tough one. So do like a, a name that um, important Buddhist teaching contest uh, and everybody wins. Um, so I'm gonna have us do one more practice here together. Oh, Michael, please, yeah. Just I was thinking about what you were talking about in relation to emptiness and relation to compassion. And for about 20 years, I worked as a psychologist with uh, sex offenders. Mm. And um, that was a bit challenging because uh, on the one side, you have people trying to engage you in their self-justification, self-pity. On the other side, you've got, uh, you know, a very, very um, adversarial social co context and for me, um, that, you know, that, that um, I think of the Bodhisattva vow, but uh, greed, hatred, and, in, and ignorance rise endlessly. Mm -hmm. And to me, that meant that, that means that um, within me, these, these are arising, and they're arising out of causes and conditions which are vast, as you were talking about mm -hmm. before. But what it was really helpful in doing was sometimes I just had to <laughs> say it over to myself very loudly. Um, but it was it helped me recognize that these people who are challenging are arising from causes and conditions, vast causes and conditions. And I could yeah. I could specify some of them easily. Um, and it was about okay. What have I, what have we got now? We've got cho mm. we've got to work out how to make choices. So that's mm. my you know. And you mentioned a while ago um, enlightened self interest. Um, I could sometimes work from a very low base on enlightened self interest. Like if you can just avoid twenty seconds without headbutting something, <laughs> somebody that's brilliant. But it, it has that it. it it's the same thing, you know, if you can recognize, um, start to have some reflection about what the consequences of your actions are. Um, mm. You're starting. And so consequently, you know, it was possible to feel mm. compassion for people like that uh, because mm. 
I could recognise that there was so much stuff that mm -hmm. they had no control of where they got to in life. They only had to start to have to make choices when they could. Yeah. Wow, Michael, I so appreciate you sharing with us. Um, yeah, I think you're demonstrating, right, that we can have this empathy that allows our compassion. You know, your understanding of the cause. And it's interesting. I, I, I love the shorthand of just causes and conditions. Causes and conditions. Like, you don't actually even need to know what they are. You, you know, sometimes you do. And of course, in a therapeutic relationship, you will. But for most of us, we might meet someone and we're like, Jesus, like what the cause and conditions, right? We just don't know. It's unknowable often, just all the factors that lead to people acting in ways that are harmful and to be able to really feel that. And so interesting, this idea of, you know, here's where they are. Can I help them make better choices? So really um, kind of having reality-based um, compassionate desire because you were in the, in the um, you know, in service, you were enacting compassion, compassion in action. And for those of us who have that opportunity, we all do, but if that's something we do on a day-to-day -day basis, can we be very clear about our compassionate action so that it can yield an outcome um, for the folks we're, we're, um, we're serving? And again, that this brings me back to the Bodhisattva prayer. It's not, may I be, a bridge for someone who wants to swim. It's may I be a bridge for someone who wants to cross over. And may I be a lamp for someone not who wants to go to sleep, but someone who wants light. Like we meet people where they are as they are. That is compassion. So yeah, thank you for that. Geneva. Hi. Um, this has been great. I, what I wanted to say is I volunteer at a cat rescue. It's an animal rescue. I work in the adult cat room. And we have like 50 adult cats and it's, it's like love and compassion in action. It's mm. such an incredible demonstration to see. A lot of these cats, have, their owners have died or horrible things have happened. They end up in the pound. Mm. We rescue them. And they come and they're afraid. We keep them in a cage at first so they can get used to the sounds. And then when they come out, within a week, they're cuddled up with the other cats. They're mm -hmm. hanging out. We don't have cat fights. We don't have all this aggression or territorial stuff. Mm -hmm. It's like harmony and caring. And it's just really beautiful. It's a lesson every time I go in to see how these cats respond to one another. And there's just some that some of the cats that have been there a while, they can see how emotionally disturbed some of the cats are. And they'll just go out of their way to hang out with them and lick their ears and lick their neck and cuddle up with them and sit there. And it's like, wow, it's just really opens your heart that that's how things really are mm -hmm. without, you know, what we do to them with our mind and thinking about ourselves and stuff. Anyway, I just wanted to share that that animal world is so beautiful. Yeah. Thank wow. you. That's beautiful. Yeah, I, it's amazing to hear um, that connection and that, um, you know, indeed some cats definitely struggle and have territorialism, but it sounds like in this context, there's a real sense of maybe kind of collectivism and that is possible for all of us. We are a reflection of nature. Um, yeah, yeah, that's, I think it is nice in some ways also to, you know, go into a mature forest and see the relationships of the trees and the ferns and the vines and that's yeah, us too. Um, very heartening. Beautiful. So we'll do a, uh, just a small closing practice focused actually on loving kindness this time. Our true causes of happiness. So dropping right into the body.
I'm taking a moment to consider what it feels like to be truly and genuinely happy. Maybe that's an image, maybe there's sensations in the body. And using our wisdom and inquiry, consider what do we need from the world to support our happiness? And with an aspiration of loving kindness for ourselves, considering the world could rise up to meet us. Maybe there's something we need professionally, relationally, our physical or mental health. Just consider the world offering up and meeting us in our needs. And considering what we need personally, how we might want to transform, what we might want to learn. And again, with this aspiration of loving kindness, considering that we would have the strength and integrity and ability to really support our well being. And imagining that we experience this contentment supported by the world, supported by ourself. How would we like to catalyze this? How would we like to support others? And if it's comfortable bringing your hands together in prayer in front of the chest. And consider dedicating our time here together. Offering up any joy, any insight. feeling into this desire that all beings be happy know the true causes of happiness all beings be free of suffering knowing the true causes of suffering all beings be free Thank you. For more love and compassion next week, double header, Chandra and I together. Be lovely. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank so you for happy. coming. Thanks for being together, Sangha. Wonderful to see you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Mason, Pam. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>